Welcome to the Baton Twirling Podcast, a show about all things baton twirling. From the latest news to interviews with world champions and connections made along the way, I am your host, Sarah Rudine. Baton twirling has taken me on an amazing journey, and I'm here to share part of that journey with all of you, one episode at a time. So sit back, enjoy the show, and let's get rolling. Going to college can be pretty scary. I was leaving the state of Texas for Arizona, and I didn't know anyone. I knew I was going to twirl with the band, but I didn't know what to expect with the band program. However, I was walking through the band area at freshman orientation and heard a familiar song, except it was in band form. Turns out, as I'd later learned, the band director and I were both Red Hot Chili Peppers fans. Needless to say, we got along wonderfully. Even better, he agreed to be on the podcast today. I can't wait for you to meet Professor Jay Reese, formerly with the Pride of Arizona Marching Band and now with the University of Miami Band. Super excited to welcome Jay Reese. Um, He's now the band director at the University of Miami. So go ahead and tell us about yourself and... Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for having me. It is, it is, uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and it's a joy to see you again because you were such an outstanding uh, member of the band at the University of Arizona when you were there. And in fact, you were uh, what, one of the things I always remember about you is that you were the very first twirler mm. uh, to ever take our leadership class. Yeah, uh, and uh, because we we offered, I offered a leadership class on sort of how to become drum major, how to become a section leader, and that kind of thing. And you were like, "Well, I want to be a better leader. I want to be a leader within the twirling team." And so you jumped in and, and dived in. You know, rolled up your sleeves and did that. Uh, and <laughs> and it was it was spectacular. And you were a wonderful leader and a great great person. So I I. I'm just so thrilled to be here with you. Well, thank um, you. <laughs> I'm like getting all right now. <laughs> uh, I've been a band director for a long time. I was the band director at the University of Arizona for 21 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had twirlers that entire time. And so I'm excited to talk about twirling. I've now been here at the University of Miami directing the bands for six years. And, um, and I haven't had twirlers, although I've had a couple of experiences. And I will be having a twirler again starting next season. Fingers crossed that yeah. there is a next season, um, <laughs> all the changes and that kind of thing. And college football might be scheduled differently and that kind of thing based on the pandemic. But um, but so I have a lot of different perspective on twirling. And when I was in high school, way back when, in the 70s in Michigan, I grew up outside of Detroit and I was a high school drum major. That was a time when it was still very, very expected uh, mm-hmm. that a drum major would twirl the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, you'll still see that very rarely, but you'll still see that a little bit, say, with, like, the Ohio State drum major. Mm-hmm. You know, there's still a couple of old school bands that where the drum major does twirl the time. So when I became drum major in high school in 1977 or whatever it was, um, one of the things I had to do was learn how to twirl the time. Mm-hmm. And so I did, and I took lessons, and I loved it. I absolutely adored it. And uh, and continued to enjoy doing that, not just as I was a drum major in high school, but then after high school, I taught for the Fred J. Miller clinics every yeah. summer. I taught leadership and drum majoring and guard and all those kinds of things. And so I continued to be around really high level baton twirlers mm-hmm. uh, because, of course, Fred himself was a national champion twirler, and as was his wife Marlene and all the, the whole the whole Miller family and that whole crew. So I was always around that. So I have a very a uh, different perspective, I think, on twirling than some band directors because I actually have done it yeah. and appreciate it and enjoyed it, and uh, and um, so yeah, I'm I'm glad to be here. Great. Uh, so tell us, is it true? Do all band directors hate baton twirlers? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think that's true. I mean, I understand why there is that perception. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I don't think that band directors hate the taunt words, but what is interesting, and you know, this is true in everything in life is you have to know your audience, so to speak, right? Mm-hmm. If you go into a job interview and you're talking to this person who's interviewing you, you need to understand, well, what is it they're looking for? What is it that's important to them? Yeah. Right. Not just what's important to me trying yeah. to get this job. You know, um, I often will talk to my fellow band directors about our challenges as we work with athletic departments, because band directors are musicians first mm-hmm. and sports fans second, so <laughs> yeah. to speak. You know what I mean? 
And yet the athletic department really doesn't care about the music. They just ex- are happy that there are colorful looking, excited people in the stands that mm-hmm. they can count on, you know? Yeah. So I always tell my fellow band directors, you know, you have to understand what is it that an athletic department thinks is important because it's not the same thing you think is important. Yeah. And if you understand that, then you can have a conversation where there's where there's mutual respect and mutual understanding. And I think that's the key to this issue as well, is what are band directors think of twirlers? What do twirlers think about being part of a band? Mm-hmm. I think we have to understand what's important to each side of that equation. Yeah. So here's the thing. For me, as a band director, and I think most band directors, our goal is to bring something together and make it cohesive. That's mm-hmm. what musicians do. Yeah. We want to bring all these disparate people together and make one piece of music happen mm-hmm. or one beautiful formation on the field. You see what I mean? Yeah, we're yeah. Just, we're, we're all about synchronizing and making things cohesive. A lot of what happens in baton twirling is baton twirlers who come at it from a very individual soloistic place Mm -hmm. and a very competitive place so their priority is not about looking the same as something else their priority is about accomplishing the trick and doing well in the competition Mm -hmm. right yeah i I catch this you know (laughs) yeah priority is catching the damn thing you know (laughs) yeah my priority as a band director of course i want you to catch the thing but my priority is that it is cohesive and synchronized and relates to what's going on in the field musically and visually. Mm -hmm. And so the, the basic disconnect between twirlers and band directors comes from when the twirler is thinking, I just want to go out in the field and do my solo routine and, and be this cool thing that's happening over here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they don't understand that what the band, the band director really isn't interested in creating a three ring circus on the field. Mm -hmm. Band director's goal is to make something that is captivating because it's all unified and synchronized. Yeah. So, so that's the first thing that happens. And I'll tell you a quick story about that. When I first came here to the university of Miami, um, I inherited a young lady who uh, was a baton twirler and had twirled with the band the previous season. And so she came to me and said, you know, I've been the featured twirler with this band um, and you're the new band director. And so, you know, here's what I do as the featured twirler. And we kind of were off on the wrong foot right Right. away. (laughs) I wasn't interested in what she thought the twirler should do. Yeah. I was interested in her knowing what I think a twirler right. should do. <laughs> and so, and so then, but I was, I was cool about it. And I was like, well, it's nice to meet you. She was a very talented young lady. And I said, here's what we're going to do. You're going to be featured during the pregame show, mm-hmm. which is, you know, very raw, raw, yeah. school song, fight song kind of thing, old style march. You know, it's, it's kind of more of that old school kind of vibe. And, um, and we're going to feature you during the pregame show, during the fight songs, and, and you'll be very much a featured twirler during that. But during uh, some of the halftime shows, um, there may not be a role for a featured twirler. Mm-hmm. And, and if there is, it may be more as uh, making you synchronized with the dance team or yeah. with the color guard. And then maybe having like that one solo moment where you go to a two or a three baton type, you know, bit to like have a little feature and that kind of thing. And so we started to rehearse the first couple of days of band camp and into the, the beginning of the season. And we weren't really a week into the season where she came to me and she said, you know, she was very angry and very upset. She said, you know, you're just not, you're just not utilizing me correctly. You're just not, you know, you know, featuring me enough or correctly or in the right ways. Right. And, you know, Sarah, you know me. Yeah. I <laughs> Like, how'd that work out for you, girl? <laughs> and so, you know, I said to her, I said, well, um, then I am going to utilize you differently. And here's what we're going to do. You're never going to twirl here ever again. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that's how that went down. And yeah. Like I said, you know me, so <laughs> yeah. you, knew, you knew that's how that was going to go down. You know, and it was because she was not interested in doing anything other than exactly what she thought the yeah. time twirling was. And that's that's 
really, I think, a, an important illustration of, of where that disconnect, I think, can happen between yeah. band directors and twirlers is that the band director might get to the point where if they have enough experiences with a young, enough young ladies who look at it that way, yeah. then they're going to just say, twirlers are prima donnas. They just want to be the, the, they just want all attention on them. Yes. They're not really interested in, in being part of this band performance. Mm -hmm. Now, as you know, at the University of Arizona, where I was for 21 years, we had a twirling team. Mm -hmm. And we had, whether it be, you know, some years it was 12, 14, maybe it was six, maybe it was eight. You know, we, we, the, the size of the team changed all the time based on the quality of the young ladies that we had available. Mm -hmm. But that was very much a, an approach where we, we approached the twirling team as if it was like the color guard or a dance line, where mm -hmm. it, it really was a synchronized, uniform twirling routine that all 12 girls were doing yeah and it wasn't you know 12 different featured twirlers you know doing their own thing yeah. and all of the routine all of the work all of the twirling was very specifically choreographed mm -hmm. to the specific music i think another issue that happens and i know this from having been around the world of competitive twirling some you know is that unfortunately musicality the the musicality of twirling sometimes takes a second row is right. in the second room <laughs> to again accomplishing the tricks mm -hmm. you know and so like you'll you know you'll see so twirlers go out there and compete and they just do their routine as fast as they yeah. can as many tricks as they can and as many double illusions of back catch and you know do everything they can fit in there and it has no relationship to the music that's being played at the same time. Mm -hmm. Band directors are always going to react negatively to that kind of approach. They want to see really, really the way to look at it is they want to see a dancer first. Mm -hmm. Because a dancer would never just go out to a piece of music and just do every move they could think of as fast as yeah. possible. The yeah, dancer thinks, I'm going to hit this accent. I'm going to hit this big moment. I'm going to do something soft with this softer moment in the music. You know, mm -hmm. they're very much interpreting the music. And so twirlers need to realize that what band directors want is they want a dancer who has this really cool prop. Yeah. Really cool things with. You see what I mean? Oh, yeah. So yeah. The twirler is talking to a band director, approaching a band director, understanding a band director, that's that's where they need to come from. And I think that if they speak that language to a band director, that band director is probably going to be very, very open to it. I have a situation now where I have an incoming student here at the University of Miami who's a very fine twirler coming out of her high school program. And when I first met with her, when she first was thinking about applying to the UM and coming here, she came to me and said, you know, so do you want a featured twirler? And I said, no, I don't. I said, but what I would be interested in talking to you about, because you're very talented and hardworking and, and wonderful, is I'd like to talk to you about being a part of the band program mm -hmm. and featuring you with your baton at times. Yeah. And other times, perhaps you're part of the dance line or perhaps you're part of the color guard, depending on your choice. Would you like to twirl flags sometimes and then baton sometimes? Or would you like to just dance with the dancers sometimes and then pick up a baton sometimes? And, you know, we had that conversation. She was really open to that. Yeah. And, and so we're going to be looking at that kind of a situation, you know, um, because for me, I don't want to see just one solo twirler on the field doing their whole thing for an entire <laughs> halftime show. Yeah. It just doesn't relate to the other things that are going on. I'd love to feature twirling, you know. But I think that there are ways to do it where the, the twirler maybe for part of the show is – is synchronized with the dance line or synchronized with the color guard. Yeah. And then you feature them as the twirler. So there's different ways to do it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, that's one thing that when I first came to the U of A, I'd never seen a, a good twirling line on the field. And during band camp, uh, you know, I, we were doing all these routines together and learning how to twirl on a team. Everybody's doing the same exact thing. And it wasn't until I watched old shows that I saw how cool it could look just doing a, everybody doing a flourish together versus everyone trying to do a toss solution. You get all different heights of batons and all this. And it was like, give me the flourish. Like right. this is like, you don't need hard tricks. You don't need all this fancy stuff. And 
Right. Yeah. So I definitely understand. Like even when I create routines now, the first thing I do is listen to the music. I write out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I find out where the hits are in all of those. So I know when to toss the baton. So I have all of the hits done first and then I go back and fill it all in. Um, exactly. And so that's, you know, for when twirlers who are trying to work with a, maybe looking to, to be involved with a college band or a high school band, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, they just need to understand that the band director is going to be about the musicality first, yeah. you know, and also the accuracy first, mm-hmm. because, you know, again, if you have uh, eight twirlers on the field or two twirlers on the field and one of them drops, yeah. then everybody's eyes goes to that, no matter how cool everything <laughs> yeah. else was before or after it. So there is a a balance Mm -hmm. that has to be found between doing something that is going to be clean and together. Like you say, do a basic flourish and it's together. Oh my God, that looks great. Yeah. But also at the same time, pushing the the level and making it exciting and making it exciting for the students as well. I do the same thing for my trumpet players. Mm -hmm. I want my trumpet players to play perfectly together and be amazing. And so I want to write the music in a way that is uh, achievable mm-hmm. to be great, but then I also want to push them. I also want it to be exciting to them and to the audience. So it's got to be kind of hard, yeah. but it can't be unachievable hard. So where is that balance? Twirling is a great example of, of, of how important that balance is going to be in a performance, because mm-hmm. if the twirling isn't somewhat demanding, then it's not very interesting, yeah. but if it's not clean, then I am going to watch something else. I'm, right. going to watch the drum line. I'm going to watch the drum line. I'm going to watch something else. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, so finding that 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 balance is really, really key. And I was always really proud of what we did at, at the University of Arizona because I think we found that balance. I think we challenged you guys as twirlers, mm-hmm. but we also worked hard to be a synchronized, unified performance ensemble. Yeah. You know, um, I, yeah, I think that, I think that uh, the... The twirler, again, going into it, sometimes they think, oh, if it's going to be a team of twirlers, they think kind of like old school majorette routines and they think it's going to be cheesy and dumb. Yeah. You know, and just, you know like just, you know, you know, right. <laughs> and so, again, that's why I say it. I don't think that, you know, I don't think that a twirling team has to be 1965 majorettes that right. actually do anything. I think a twirling team can be really demanding and exciting. Mm-hmm. But it's got to come from the musical place first. It's got to be about synchronizing. It's got to be about the body lines as much as about the, the baton itself. Yeah. Definitely. I always said to you guys, you know this, you remember this, I'm going to take you down memory lane. I'd always say to you guys, I, you know, put the stick down. I want to see you do the routine without yeah. the baton because that's got to be clean. Because if that doesn't look good, it doesn't matter if you catch it or not. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, I know a lot of high schools have, or so taking it to the high school level, and I think you did a little of this in the college level, um, but a lot of twirlers aren't allowed to twirl for the first year. And my thought is learn how to march first. Like you have to learn how to march. You have to learn how to be a part of the show. Do you agree with that, um, that the way that they approach it like that? Or do you think, how, what's your thought on that? Well, I think every program is different. I mean, I understand the programs that, that have uh, big numbers and, and lots of kids coming in and out. And so they're going to um, come up with a system where where the, the younger students have to sort of apprentice a little bit for a while, you know, kind of kind of learn some, some things before they're really on the field, maybe their sophomore year. I understand that that happens. That happens in Texas a lot with those bigger programs that yeah. are really competitive. You know, 420. Um, but, you know, but then there's programs where, you know, you're going to put every kid that wants to be on the field on the field. Yeah. You know, and that's true of college bands as well. So it, it's true at both levels. You know, the high school band might be doing that because they're wanting to be very competitive. Mm-hmm. You know, a college band is going to do that just because it's a numbers game. Yeah. You know, um, like the University of Oklahoma, they could have twice as big a band if you just think about how many students want to be in the band. So they audition everybody and you know, you make the band. The University of Michigan has almost like an entire B band, mm-hmm. you know, um, that are alternates that are trying to make the band that actually performs on Saturdays, you know. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then there's bands, um, you know, here in the ACC where I am, myself, you know, our, ours is a small, we're at a small private institution. So every kid that wants to be on the field, he's on the field from day one. He yeah. or she's on the field from day one, whether they're 
you know, a great trumpet player, a, a good guard member, never picked up a flag before. It doesn't matter. They're on the field. So it's really specific to the program, how they handle that. Yeah. I do think that anybody who's in a situation where they have to sort of um, wait a year or, or kind of be in a, be an alternate for a year, mm -hmm. you know, don't get down on that. There's, yeah. there's really great things to learn from those experiences. And yeah. you know, I've always told people that, you can learn amazing, valuable lessons by working with people that are better than you and by working with people that are not as strong as you and everything in between. There are important, yeah. le there are different lessons, but there are important lessons no matter what. So if you're in that really competitive environment where you have to sort of pay your dues before you get on the field, learn from that. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a situation where you're going to get thrown right into the fire and you've got to be on the field right away and maybe you're not ready for it, well, learn from that too. <laughs> I've done both. So yeah. I remember the first time I had a, a clap for everyone during that leadership class. And they're like, every single musician, I didn't even notice that they're like, like, do you know how to count a second? And I was like, why? How would you even do that? Like, how is that even possible? And everyone's like, oh, I learn more from those situations that I do from walking in somewhere and being like, okay, I know everything. Let me go ahead and teach. No, give yeah. me the one where I'm learning in the fire. Throw me in the fire. That's how I want to learn. <laughs> good, exactly. Yeah, good advice. I've talked to twirlers about this before. Um, this isn't my first time talking to a band director about this. Um, but one thing that kind of made me step back and think like, oh, yeah, of course, um, especially in high school, they said, you're, you're not there as long as the band director plans to be there. In four years, you're not going to care because you're going to be out of here or however long it is. Um, so I think when twirlers don't come at it like that, they're thinking like, okay, you know, I need to do this so I can get to college and I can do this. And, um, yeah. So it was just making me think about that. It's four years well, for me, but true. 20 band for you. Directors, band directors in general, um, have to, again, balance two things. Yeah. We want every one of our current students mm -hmm. to have a good experience right now that's valuable and meaningful. And we want that to, to be a good thing. We also want each year to get better yeah. and we want to get better at our jobs. We want our students to have a better experience. We want to be continuing to build the program. So more and more people are attracted to it mm -hmm. and more and more people want to support it and are, you know, excited to watch that band at halftime or, or in that, uh, that exhibition performance or whatever it might be. So I always have to, as a band director, I have to be thinking about five years from now. Yeah. And where's the program then? But I can't lose sight of the student who's in front of me right now who won't be here five years from now. Mm -hmm. You know, their experience matters right now. So there is there's this balance between those two things. And again, it comes back to one of my earlier points in terms of specifically in terms of twirling is that competitive twirlers, they grow up and it's all about them and it's all about right now. Mm -hmm. And it's about the trophy at the end of today. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> And so, again, if they can understand that that's not where the band director is coming from, mm -hmm. that you're going to have a better relationship, you're going to have a better conversation, you know. Yeah. So the twirler needs to say, well, what can I bring to the table right now? Mm -hmm. What do I bring to this right now? Well, I bring a great work ethic and I bring charisma and I bring a talent that is is exciting to watch for people. And, and, and you know, so I bring these things right now. But I also understand that the band director's priority is the musicality of it, the synchronization, the mm -hmm. synchronization of it, the long-term benefit to all the students, to future students that aren't even here yet. Yeah. So mm -hmm. every twirler can also realize that any experience they have with a band director is going to either positively or negatively impact some twirler in the future. Yeah. Yeah. With that band director. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's it for today. Make sure you tune in next week to hear part two of our interview with Jay Reese.